There you go. I sent you images of that cylinder when you got a second. Ooh. All right. What is going on, guys? Welcome to the Wednesday Night Live stream. On the phone line, we got Mr. Nick Chan. How are you doing, Nick? Hey, I'm good. Doing good. Hey, everybody. How are you doing? Excellent. Excellent. Uh, saving on some bandwidth today, so just going to do audio only. Um, hopefully you guys can hear him well. Um, so Nick, I haven't actually seen you in a while. How, how's life? How's things? I know. It's been a while, right? It has I was been just a while. earlier that uh, I want to catch up on your previous few live streams because I've been heads down. So yeah, that'll be fun. But uh, no, I've been okay. Oh, excellent, excellent. Um, so today we kind of want to talk a little bit about kind of feeding fish and are you overfeeding? Are you underfeeding? Have you found that magical sweet spot? And there's a lot of people that definitely overfeed their tanks, which generally will lead to algae issues or other type of nutrients issues that could affect coral growth and other stuff within their systems. Uh, quickly skim in the comments. Calypso, Kevin, Gabe's, Dr. Welsh, what is going on, guys? Zinzop, best live stream to tune into on the drive home. Thank you very much. Josh, what's going on? Sharbuckles, Re Jaylee, Reefer, Cindy. Nick's in the chat too. All right, guys. So hopefully you guys are having a wonderful Wednesday. <laughs> I was laughing. What's going on, Greg? I was laughing one of the comments earlier. They're like, I definitely overfeed. That's why I spent $500 on a skimmer. <laughs> 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 and and that, is, that is a very fair point because mm. a decent skimmer lets you get away with more. So something to consider. Now, there's kind of two very different mentalities where some people will feed very light and skimpy. You know, I have some, you know, one store I talked to in the past, they only feed every other day. Now, on the opposite of the spectrum, look at like Worldwide Corals or somewhere where they basically feed the tank hourly when, when they're open. So two completely different ends of the spectrum. Now, one of the things that I think you also got to consider is the type of fish you have. If you have something like tangs, they're omnivores and they're going to graze all day. Like they like their algae, like definitely heavy on the herbivores. And like I put nori in my tank every single day. Like I definitely, if anything, I probably overfeed. There's no chance. Heck I'm underfeeding my tank because I just dump in tons of food. Now recently my nutrients have been zero. So I'm just dumping even more food in just to do it because I can uh, part of it's more for the corals because I'm trying to see if that extra food is going to benefit the corals. Am I going to get better growth and colors? I mean, some corals definitely are getting more colors from the more food in the tank. So that's another kind of way to look at it. Now, certain fish like antheas, for instance, they have very, very tiny stomachs. They're very active and they need to eat very frequently. Uh, what is going on, guys? About eight bazillion messages coming by. What is going on, everyone that needed to join? What is up, Ash? Click, clack, Sharbuckles. Uh, Sharbuckles, buy a skimmer rated for twice your tank. That's That could be a whole nother topic, actually. There's also another interesting outlook on potentially over-skimming your tank. You know, are you removing too much from your tank? There's a lot of these weird little rabbit holes that you can kind of bridge into or dig into off some of the stuff. <laughs> At least I definitely overfeed. So, Nick, what about you? Do you overfeed or underfeed your fish? Ah, uh, that's a good question because it's like you were just saying that it really depends on the livestock because mm -hmm. people that know me and that I talk to, the one thing I always say is look at the animals you want to keep mm -hmm. and then design everything around them rather than, you know, get a tank and then, you know, escape it out and then go to the shop and go, oh, that's a pretty fish and take it home, put it in the tank and then, hey, can anyone tell me what this fish and what it needs? Yeah. Like, you know. Um, I mean, I do appreciate for some people it's like, well, I only had this budget to spend, so I had to get this tank. But then, yeah, okay, we'll do that. But then look at the animals that, that the tank that you've bought and the things you've done with it, it it's going to be, you know, it's going to marry up to mm -hmm. and do it that way. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like you're saying, Anthea, small stomachs, uh, very energetic fish, they need several feeds a day. Um, I had my pet uh, for a couple of years in my office, which was uh, Malcolm. Um, you know, a, a puffer fish, mm -hmm. and um, they eat once every three or four days. You feed them till the stomachs are full. He goes and crawls into his cave and sits there for a day and a half digesting it. You know, um, so different animals, different fish require different, you know, feeding routines. Um, and that's why I'm a little bit like, uh, you know, rather this general rule that we've had in the hobby for so long where you say, well, how much should I feed? And the general rule 
a thumb is whatever is consumed within one one to two minutes. Mm -hmm. If there's food left uneaten, then you fed too much. If they still you know gobble it all up and are still looking for more, feed a bit more. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know necessarily whether that that's the right approach. You know that blanket approach. You know? Yep. No, I I kind of agree, and this partially depends on your lifestyle and if you're manually feeding or if you have an auto feeder. But mm -hmm. I also think you're better off feeding multiple small feedings rather than just the one nightly dousing of food, just a ton of food once a time, right? If you can, you know, you know, give them a snack in the morning, give them a snack at nighttime, or you know, if you you have the option to give them three meals a day, I mean, the more the merrier, in my opinion. But you don't want to be excessive amounts every single one. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, I mean, the thing is, is uh, like we were chatting the other day about, you know, what we we're going to discuss today. Um, and I have, like every hobbyist, you know, I have my own theories mm -hmm. and I have some knowledge and I have some, uh, like people that have more extensive information and knowledge than I do that cascade down to me. So I'm just like every other <laughs> hobbyist where I'm always learning. And then some of the aspects of my hobby is like, well, this is what I think because it makes sense to me with the experience I've got and all the other things we do. But let me go and read into this and check. So um, I did a little bit of research into like feeding and what's good and what's bad for the fish and things like that. And one of the things I've always thought was that if we if fish are, um, some fish are quite opportunist feeders. So if you walk past the tank, they'll come up to the top because they associate you with food. And you think, well, how can you guys still be hungry? I only fed you like an hour ago, right? <laughs> so you're just being greedy now. Mm. And, and what it is, I think, for, for some of the fish or a lot of the fish is that that's exactly what it is. Like their brains is like their instinct is, is to feed, you know, is to eat. Mm -hmm. So if we give them food, uh, they're going to eat it. Now, what happens if they, their intestinal tracts and their stomachs and that are already full of food? Well, you know, the, the, the instinct to the fish could be, well, I still want to eat more because that's fresh and I don't want them going to eat again. Mm -hmm. And what often happens if you if you look when you feed your fish, what often happens is as they start eating, they also expel, you know, they also poo in the tank mm -hmm. at the same time. So I was thinking, well, are they just trying to make room for more food, mm -hmm. you know? And if they do that, how much of the food that's, that they already have in them is being fully utilized before they're expelling it, you know, almost voluntary to make room for more? If I didn't feed them, would they have kept that food in them longer and got more, you know, out of the food? Mm -hmm. So I did a bit of reading and I found a couple of articles that discussed that. And they were saying that, you know, some of the, the things, nutrients from food, like, like fat, sugars, proteins are, are quite easily, readily absorbed from the food quite quickly. And that made sense because fish are energetic. They need energy to swim. Mm -hmm. And then they were saying that some of the things in the food take a little bit longer to, to, for the body to absorb. So if you feed too frequently or too much and they're expelling the food kind of like to make way for more, then they're not necessarily getting everything they need. So then they might have like, you know, things going wrong internally in the kidneys mm -hmm. and, and, and other things like that. So that kind of made sense to me. So that's one of the reasons why I like, depending on the fish, um, I tend to keep fish that I can feed once every two or three days rather than Anthea's that I need to feed several times during the day because my lifestyle is that I, I, I don't always have time to do that. So mm -hmm. I stock my tanks appropriately to what I want to be able to do and, and what's right for the fish. Stock it to your lifestyle and which fish are compatible, yeah. which makes sense. Exactly, yeah. Now, the, the other thing you're saying too about if they're getting too much food, they may purposely be you know just hammering through it just to get that next bite of food that's coming in, which again mm. leads to more ammonia and fish waste and nitrate nitrates in your tank. Um, now, do you, what is your view on kind of fish fasting where some people, you know, a day a week, they won't feed their fish or they'll feed every other day type of thing. Yeah. I mean, I do that uh, generally mm -hmm. uh, with the fish that I keep. And um, to be honest, I'm, I remember Paul at uh, Reef Community Worldwide and his tank, and he had issues with his parameters and stuff. And one of the things I suggested to him because of the type of fish he had, uh, he had an eel in there. And I said, to be honest, Paul, your, your eel uh, is, is, is contributing to the issues because of the way they eat, you know. 
and uh, so he got rid of it. <laughs> I didn't yeah. expect him to. I was just kind of sort of saying, look, this is one of the, that's causing it. So, you know, and he went, oh, well, I'll get rid of that then. <laughs> and he took it out of his tank and, 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 and get, sold it somewhere. And then uh, he focused on, on the fish that were like, um, and I said to him, well, try and feed less, but watch the fish. You know, watch your fish because we're not here to starve fish. Mm-hmm. You know? And um, so what he did was he cut down his, his feeding and uh, his, his system improved. His corals started growing, you know, mm-hmm. growth tips. It was cleaner. It was looking better. And I said to him, well, what about your fish? Have you noticed any weight loss? And he said, no. He said, they look exactly the same as they did before. He said, the only thing I noticed is that they're scavenging more. Yep. And, uh, and I said, well, that's the thing. Because you're not feeding them uh, as often doesn't mean they're not eating as much because – then if their instinct is to, to okay, um, I've been fed. Um, and I was speaking to my parents earlier, and I said this to him, imagine like, you know, you have a big stomach full of food on a Sunday after a big roast meal or whatever you have on a Sunday. You want to just sit in the chair and fall asleep in the afternoon, right? Mm-hmm. So my, my assumption is that we're all organisms of the same kind of ilk. So um, if you give your fish a good feed, are they then – with the bellies full, are they then going to want to scavenge and hunt? I would imagine they just want to drift around and swim gently while all the, you know, the, the, the blood and everything, you know, digests the food mm-hmm. like the rest of us. So when you haven't done that to them and they've got, you know, they're, they're in a stage where it's like, oh, well, what do I do now? Um, so I think that's why they tend to scavenge you more because it's like they don't feel – you know, that they need to rest. It's more like, oh, I'll look around and see what there is to eat, Mm -hmm. you know. So by doing that, they're they're, they're finding food, you know. And with, um, actually, speaking of fish scavenging, that's actually a really good sign of overfeeding or not. If your fish stop kind of scouring the rocks and picking and forging all day, then that's a good sign that, you know, they probably have too much food and they're not actually performing their, you know, natural roles to an extent. Yeah, and I would say like uh, tangs in particular. I, I mean, you know, Dev, but I mm-hmm. I hate tangs. I don't like tangs, not because they're not beautiful fish. I just don't like keeping them. Um, uh, but that's a different topic. Um, but a good indication that tangs are happy and healthy to me when I do see them in people's tanks is that they're head down grazing. Mm-hmm. You know, they spend a lot of time grazing, and yeah, then they'll spend time swimming around. And the worst sight for me is when I see that tang just swimming up and down the glass you know all day long and then go crazy when the food goes in or when the uh, piece of nori goes into the clip and they go crazy rag it around and then the rest of the time they're just swimming up and down the glass Mm -hmm. and to me that's just not normal behavior for that type of fish Um, and i've got friends that have got big systems that have tangs in them and one of the things they always say to me is like yeah it's great my tangs are just head down trimming the the you know the algae as it's the little shoots of algae as it's growing and they purposely put some flat rock you know at different places in the tank for them to graze on mm-hmm. um and and so for me how can we have the same kind of species of fish in one tank swimming up and down glass and then in another tank you know grazing and swimming around to me that you know sort of uh displaying natural kind of behavior yeah you know? Def- definitely makes a big difference when they're more more natural, more, you know, natural behaviors, I guess, more than anything. Mm. Um, so another type of thing, too, with fish is I believe, you know, it's worth buying quality food for them as well. I find a lot of the cheaper budget foods just have a lot of fillers and ash and all this other type of stuff mixed in with them. Mm. So it can be one kind of view, too, is if your fish is, I mean, one of the times, I mean, fish are like puppies. You walk up to the tank, they're all going to be there begging for food. Um, so, I mean, you got to ex- assume that one to a, a percent. But if your fish is constantly eating and never gets full, it could be that they're just getting empty food, right? They're getting like empty calories. It's not fully feeding them with nutritious stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting one because I know from time to time, if you look at manufacturers, they... Uh, there seems to be in the hobby like trends for different things. Mm-hmm. So one year the trend will be focusing on um, uh, like automatic doses like now with the, the Alcatronic and, yep. and, and stuff like that. And, it's, you know, the, the manufacturers and the hobby itself, people are focusing on that. Another mm-hmm. year 
they'll be focusing on on return pumps because a new return pumps being launched and all the manufacturers are kind of launching the app controllable return pumps and that seems to be the focus at that time and i remember uh back probably a few years now uh there were some companies providing food that was like uh, you you would buy uh, maybe two or three different pots of food, mm-hmm. and you would cycle between those three pots to give a balanced diet, yep. rather than just get one pot and just feed them that. Mm-hmm. And I think that's great. Um, you know, you can buy grazers for tangs, and you can buy you know more meaty food for angels and so on. Uh, but I'm a big believer in in people trying to make their own food as well, from you know fresh mussels. Um, and shrimps and white fish and you know squid and, and and all that kind of thing you know mashing it up and you can even buy like food enhancers you know with vitamins and stuff in that you can put in that um you know to provide that and i i think that's good because like you were saying then you know there's no real additives in it mm. you know uh, binders and ash and stuff like that but yeah alongside that feed like feed pellet um i've never one tried be Sorry, go on then. Oh, it's because I've never tried doing the fully DIY food. I should one of these days get a bunch of seafood and chop it up. It'd be interesting. Yeah, for sure. I mean, mm-hmm. the thing is, is that you get. I think there's it's two. It's a double reward. One mm-hmm. is that you know your fish are getting, um, you know, like fresh, wholesome food. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other thing is, it's that sense of you know you're you're almost like a fish owner, you're a pet owner, and when you make something yourself. And they gobble it up, you know, we really like and it just takes go, Wow, I love that. Then it gives you a sense of achievement as well. You think, Oh, I, I did something for my fish and they liked it. You know? yep. I did good. They love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think that's that another reward that comes from it. Yeah, you get healthy fish, but at the same time, you mm-hmm. know, you you're getting something out of it personally that you you know, that mm-hmm. feel good factor if you like. Um, one thing I do add to my tank once in a while, just as kind of like a treat to Manila clams. I find everyone in the tank just snacks and loves it. So I usually buy some fresh ones once in a while and throw them in the freezer and pop one in every once in a while. But that's kind of, everyone seems to go on it. I just also want to talk about mixing food that popped into my head. Um, another, yeah. another question that came by a few minutes ago is, um, flakes versus frozen food. So in general, I, I probably feed frozen more than anything else, but I tend to think a variety is very important. So even, you know, some of my pellets, I just have like, you know, got new life. I got PE pellets. I got all kinds of ones just kind of mixed together. And I just randomly got it. And I got like the Niles goji berries and some of their algae ones, like just big variety. And I'll just randomly pick different foods and throw on the tank. Cause I think variety is important, right? Something might be lacking something or something else could be high in it. And it's giving your fish kind of a more varied diet. That and I'd be or bored eating the same thing every day in my life too. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean that's the thing that worries me, Dev, with with the hobby and the industry to an extent is is exactly what you said there. It it might be and it could be and what mm-hmm. if, and I hate when we don't know. Mm-hmm. And um, one thing I would say that I'd like to see is where we can get a better understanding of the fish's requirements. Who I don't know how what their recommended daily amount of vitamin A, vitamin C, mm-hmm. iron, zinc is. You know, I'll be honest, I, do, I don't know. Yeah. But why don't we? <laughs> you know, why don't we? Mm-hmm. Um, I can't find the information. Uh, uh, somebody gen- when when I talked about it on a on a Facebook group, uh, mm-hmm. somebody posted up some links, and it was more to do with. Uh, fisheries you know when they were growing salmon and 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 sea bass and trout for the food industry what what they fed and why Mm -hmm. um and i'm sure maybe somebody like richard ross you know who who uh, is a curator of a public aquarium they obviously balance their food a little bit more because they they can't overload the filtration system you know Mm -hmm. they don't want to do that so they weigh and balance the food out but us in the hobby uh, i'd like to know what my if i kept a yellow tank for argument's sake, I did it for a, a bet. <laughs> and, um, you know, I'd like to know what it needed from me. Mm-hmm. You know, not because somebody told me, oh, you need to feed it nori and uh, you want to give it some vegetable pellets and some vegetable flake once in a while. I, I want to know, no, what, what does it mean? Not just you recommending, well, try this and try that. I, I want to find somewhere where it tells me if you've got a yellow tank, this is what you should be feeding it. You know, mm-hmm. this amount of fat, this amount of protein. And I'd like, even if we can't do it by species, at least, you know, why can't we find that information as a general rule of thumb? Like we do everything else. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I know the the saltwater content that I need for my corals and my fish. I know what salinity temperature mm-hmm. it needs to be. But yeah, I don't know what I need to feed my fish. I just trust the the jar of fish food that they've put everything in it that I need. Yep. And I don't trust people very easily. And, so... <laughs> and that is exactly why I think variety is important, right? Because, mm-hmm. you know, nothing's probably perfect and there's probably pros and cons to many. So having that blend is going to, you know, up your overall nutrition value in theory. And minimize, again, you know, some has not as good stuff in it. Yeah, and again, we just hope that's the case, that by mixing various different things, we're, we're ticking all the boxes, but we still mm-hmm. don't know. What mm-hmm. I'd like to see is um, a company that produces food in this industry that we predominantly buy. So a company that, that's, I don't want to name names because I don't think that's fair, but I'll if, name if, there's a, <laughs> if there's particular companies that do really well from this hobby because everybody buys though one of those three brands mm-hmm. of food then can they not give us a sheet and say this is why our food is good because your fish need this 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 and look we we put that into our food so you're buying with confidence you know uh leds did that right we we asked about spectrums because mm-hmm. we moved from halides to t5s and we were like well we don't know what spectrums are in these leds so they started producing spectrum graphs to show us uh, to demonstrate, yes, these lights are good. Look, look at the spectrum graphs. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a, a pump will tell you what flow it produces. You know, um, yet with the food, uh, how do we know? One actually, we know? one thing that I am going to do is in sometime in the next month or so, I was talking to one of the owners, uh, Pisces Energetics, that does the mysis and the you know, the pellets and stuff, and I'm going to go visit them at their place and do shoot a video with them and. Find out some good stuff like this. So I think that'll be a good one. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's not like I'm not being like critical and saying, oh, you know, the the people in this industry are no good. What I'm saying is like, you know, we spend a lot of money on your products. Mm -hmm. We want more information from you, you know, so that we got we know that if we feed this and if we feed that, then we're doing good by our by our animals. You know, Um, the other thing is that I find interesting as well is. um, uh, I can talk about this actually. I was speaking to Michael earlier, and the company he works for, which is a UK-based company, BC UK, and they do. Uh, their their company started off with with manufacturing food, mm-hmm. and I've known uh, Nick that owns BC UK for for quite a few years, mm-hmm. and um, I know he he's just they've just launched a new food um, called the uh, Refeast, and so Michael was telling me a little bit about it today, and he was saying, yeah, we've got a canalus in it. Uh, we've got copepods in there. We've got a pea mysis in there. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it can be a little bit rich, but it's it's like a superfood. It's it's got really good stuff in it. Yeah. And he said it's a probiotic. Mm-hmm. So I said, okay, so it's probiotic. I said, but what does that mean? Is it probiotic because it's got bacteria that goes into the rocks and helps devour the unconsumed food? You know, fish waste. Is it probiotic for the health of the fish? What is it? Mm-hmm. And so he went, I can't remember what, I'll be honest, I can't remember what bacteria strain it was now, but he was saying, no, this, this bacteria strain, it goes into the uh, 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 digestion tract, intestinal tract of the fish and, and helps to, you know, break down food and stuff like that. So it's a probiotic for the fish. And I'm like, that's brilliant. So sell it on that, mm-hmm. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, tell people about that. And then what's going to happen? People are going to look at that and go, well, is my food probiotic that I'm feeding my fish now? You know, is this a benefit? You know, and that in itself might make other manufacturers go, oh, we need to up our game a little bit because yep. food is in itself is advancing and we need to keep up to date. So the more information we've got, you know, the the percent, right? And it's inspirational for everyone to kind of up their game across. Better educated we are about our, our support to an extent as well, right? Yeah, I mean, for me... In, I'll, go, I'll say this, because I know it sounds a bit uh, like I'm doing the old old school thing, but in the old days, <laughs> back, in um, back in the day, when, when I was a young reefer, mm-hmm. um, I'd go to the store to see what new products were there, you know, what was new. And the storekeeper would say, hey, Nick, you know, we've got this new pump. And they would tell me about the pump. Mm-hmm. I'd go, oh, that's great. And I might buy it and I might not buy it. I might save up my pocket money and buy it later, you know, or put it on my birthday list. Um, 
And that's how we learn about products. Nowadays, uh, we hear about a product in the UK that's launched in America that isn't available in the UK through you know, our, our American friends talking mm -hmm. about it on YouTube and, and Facebook and, and whatever else. And then we go to the stores and say, hey, do you know when this, uh, this new pump is being launched? And they go, mm, I don't know. I'll try and find out from the distributor. And then they email and phone the distributor and they go, yeah, yeah, we're working on it and the, the have got to fulfill America because it's such a big market and we might get it over here in another few months, you know, if we're lucky. <laughs> Uh, and and but so in a way the role's been reversed. That now that some of the in some respects some of the products were being released mm -hmm. uh, were demanding from the stores and were demanding from the distributors and were demanding from the manufacturers, rather than the old days where it was they put a new product on the shelf and that was the first time you knew Anything. it was available. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, um, I think the manufacturers and the distributors are definitely listening now. Because mm -hmm. I've seen it more recently in the last five to ten years, where <clears throat> there'll be a there'll be a product launched in in America, say, and no one's distributing it in the UK. We find out about it and we get one imported over, and then someone else goes, "Wow, that's amazing! Where did you get that from?" And we we say, "Oh, we imported it from this company," and they go, "Oh, I want one too." So they import one over, <laughs> and then sure enough, the UK distributors see all these people talking about these amazing pumps, amazing lights that they're bringing over direct, mm -hmm. and they go. Oh, well, we want to distribute that product now. So then they contact that company and say, "Can we distribute your product?" So, so you eventually get there. <laughs> yeah, so we're we're kind of driving to an extent in some way. You know, in some mm. products, we're driving the supply through demand. Yep. And that's why I've I more recently I've kind of said, look, if if we as a collective hobby ask for certain things, I'm sure the manufacturers and the distributors will listen. And mm -hmm. maybe provide that to us, um, such as you know, like the food. What you know, what is in the food, and 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 is it what we need to have in it? Because we want to know that. You yeah, know? I mean, it's it's getting better. Like, there's a lot of stuff. Like, I know Rod's food super popular, and there's like a or Larry's. Like, there's a ton of them that actually do list and show yeah. everything. A lot of them are made from you know raw seafood and like basically the DIY without you doing the DIY more or less. So, yeah, exactly. Which a lot of those are pretty good. Um, people ask all the time what I feed mine tank, and I've so in the morning I feed nori, so they get a half sheet of nori. I just go to the Asian supermarket and buy sushi nori, same thing, so make sure it doesn't have any additives or flavors or anything on it. Mm -hmm. So I feed nori every morning, and almost every fish in my tank eats it. You know, yeah. So which is awesome, right? Like basically everyone goes for it. Um, I have an auto feeder that drops just a very small morsel of pellets in the afternoon, so they get some afternoon snack, and then a couple hours later they get another afternoon snack, and then at night I usually feed frozen, or if I'm being lazy I'll just throw in some pellets. But most of the time I feed frozen, like mysis mm -hmm. or canalis or whatever it is. And then more recently, I've really upped my feeding of the coral, so something like reefroids or canalis or other small particulate food. I've been dosing that in a couple times a week. So that's kind of my daily. And I know I'm on the very heavy side of feeding, but my filtration is also keeping up with it, so it's not an issue. So that's another thing to consider. If you are feeding tons and tons and tons, your nutrients keep rising, that's when you know you need to tone things down. Um, but mm. if you're dumping in buckets of food and your nutrients aren't rising, you know your system can handle it. You know, your, your tank's mature enough, your corals are absorbing those nutrients, your fish are taking them, you know, or your filter's taking what's left over. So just by monitoring your nutrients is a good indication if you're overfeeding to an extent. Um, also, same with you. See, that, sorry, that's too short, but that's the weird thing, though, because this is why I hate this hobby sometimes, because for somebody new into the hobby that hasn't found their own way yet, you know, mm -hmm. their own method of what works for them and, and what they do and what they practice that, that, you know, makes every, makes the magic happen. It must be so confusing mm -hmm. because like to an extent, I agree with everything you just said, which is why I said to Paul Williams, try feeding a bit less and let's get your parameters sorted out and let's mm -hmm. start getting things going. But then once that's happened, I'm saying to Paul, right, now we're going to raise your nitrate levels and we're going to elevate your parameters. And he's mm -hmm. like, why? And I said, because now we're going to nutritionalize your coral. Yep. So automatically your parameters are going to rise. But don't worry, because it's come from a good thing. 
because mm -hmm. it's come from a good thing, things deal with it. If it's come from uh, the process of ammonia, and so you get nitrate just because it's coming from waste, nothing's mm -hmm. benefiting from that. Yeah, you know, or to an extent, you know, it's going to benefit to an extent. But if it's come from from good coral nutrition, the the negative outweigh uh, sorry the benefit outweighs the negative. So you're not going to see your corals suffer because mm -hmm. of the parameters. Now, interestingly enough. Um, Richard Ross. Uh, a few weeks ago, I watched a couple of uh, Richard's talks on YouTube, and he was discussing phosphate. Mm -hmm. And he was saying in his system how his levels of phosphate and nitrate are what we would call sky high. Mm -hmm. But his systems are not suffering because of it. And one point he said was like, look, I'm not telling you guys to let your levels go sky high because we don't really understand it still. Mm -hmm. uh, but what he was saying is that they it may be because of the like the formula or, or the ratios between the, the the nitrate and levels of phosphate and all the other stuff going on in that system mm -hmm. that make it okay you know so don't just go and let your levels go up and, and kill everything um, but it was interesting that he's got sky high levels of parameters mm -hmm. but his system is flourishing growing colorful well you know looking amazing the thing that people now there's also kind of a ratio right like if you have really high mm -hmm. nutrients you know you can get a you can do higher lighting and stuff and like increase that metabolism it's when those things are out of whack is when usually exactly you get into trouble yeah yeah so, like so that's you... why i'm saying it's confusing for a new hobbyist or somebody mm -hmm. that's nearly new because they've got people telling them oh your nutrients are high and you've got somebody else an example of oh it doesn't matter if your nutrients are high as long as this is okay and that's okay so it's like wow well, where am i <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, yeah, that, that's just another thing. If you have a super ultra no, low nutrient system, you want to run lower lighting in your system. So just throwing this one out there. For if you have really high nutrients, then you can get away with higher lighting. So that's just a general way to kind of wrap your head around it. Um, that could definitely be another stream one day. But your nutrient load to your lighting is there's definitely a good correlation on like the health of your core and what it can take. Now, you also don't want zero nutrients. Zero nutrients is bad, right? Corals need those nitrate, nitrates and phosphate. And once you have lots of coral and it's growing, I mean, they're going to be absorbing that as well, right? As well as your refugium and your skimmer or whatever else is helping you export that. Uh, red I mean, that's... Yeah. Sorry, go, on. go ahead there. Oh, I was just reading some comments. Red field ratio is another debate. Yeah, that's like the 1 to 16, something like that. The only... I don't know how well that works for like in the aquarium, but the only one key thing that I can relate with that is just if you're doing carbon dosing, you need to have phosphate in order to lower your nitrate. So I've mm. seen people be like, oh, my nitrate's not going. What's your phosphate? It's like, oh, you're running GFO and you have Zun, so it's not really lowering it. So that's something that just, I just read it, so it kept in my mind. Uh, there was some I mean, it's, my, my, I mean, if I was to advise newcomers to the hobby and nearly new people mm -hmm. i would say um go by the rule of thumb of like you were saying dev keep your parameters low because one thing it does is it's going to enable you to understand how to control it and then as you advance and as you get corals that are surviving and growing and everything else other things that you automatically will pick up along that road will then enable you to understand, you know, where the, the, the loopholes are, if you like, and how to explore, exploit them, <laughs> um, you know. But it, there's a lot of information to, to grasp yeah. before, you know, before then. So it's not that it can't be done. Mm -hmm. For me, it's like, it, but it's like, it's, it's got to come with understanding, I think, as well, to an extent. The biggest thing I'd say for a new hobbyist or somebody new, your tanks, you know, within your first six months or so, I would be a lot skimpier on the feeding on a brand new tank. Um, mm -hmm. your, your system does not yet have the bacteria load to process some of these nutrients, you know, and you may not have like a thriving refugium, whatever it is, until your tank's established. And I mean, bacteria is, is one of the biggest things that help consume waste in your tank. Now, until your tank is established, I definitely want to be on the lighter side. You know, that might be or you you know, maybe you only feed, depending on your fish, obviously. Like, if you have antheus and stuff, you got to feed a lot more. But th that might be, you know, you only feed once a day or if you need to feed it the whole every other day feeding type of thing at first. But the more your tank's established, the bigger fish get, then that's when you got to start considering upping that feeding. 
And, you know, the more coral you get, like, same thing, the more food you can add to your tank. Because, you know, corals, you know, I don't know what the percentage is, say 80, 90% from light, but that other 10%, whatever, can come from food. Like, I know my cans, for instance, like, they're way more colorful if I feed them. So there's cert- there's definitely benefits to feeding your corals on your fish. Now, if you have lots of fish and they're doing lots of poop and stuff, you know, some of that stuff's going back in and also working as kind of like a coral food or nutrients for the corals to an extent. So this is a interesting little ecosystem that we got. Yeah, I mean that's why I wish I uh, rods food that you mentioned. You know, I saw that when I was in the states, and mm-hmm. I'm not sure we even have that in the UK. I've not seen it anywhere. Yeah, and you know, I'm like, God, you guys got some good stuff. You know, I know you're in Canada, but you know, it's like, you know, rods food, Solaris food. We don't have that. The, my favorite, which we did have in this country briefly, because um, Nordic Reef, who were based where I am, were, were distributing it. And that was the uh, the coral smoothie. I don't know if you ever tried that. Though. Coral um, smoothie, no. Yeah, it's called this product called Coral Smoothie, and their catch line or their their slogan is uh, "Feed the Frenzy." Mm-hmm. And I love that product. Uh, when we had it over here for a brief period of time, uh, um, I'd, I'd get a, I'd get a bottle and, and take it to one. Like I've got friends that have got um, stores. Mm-hmm. And um, I say, hey, just put this in the coral bay, and they crack it open, and they put some in the coral bay, and all the all the corals would extend the pubs, go, yeah, thank you very much. And it was all basically, uh, it was a smoothie. It was what it says on the box. It had uh, uh, like lobster eggs and had fish eggs in it, clams, and all this stuff all mushed up. So it was basically what we were saying about DIY, but readily available off the shelf. Mm-hmm. Um, so that if you haven't tried that before, Dev, uh, have a look out in the store see if you can get some because that's really really effective food. Okay, yeah, I've never seen that one, but I'll keep an eye. I'll try to find you see it. Mm. I believe the company that uh, make it, I think it's Algagen. Mm-hmm. Off the top of my oh, head, I might that. be wrong with that. Okay, but I I've think it's one. Algagen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, roller mats and pellets, though. Okay, well, that's pause. So. Speaking of roller mats, I don't know how much of the ratio between refugium and filter roller and skimmer is, but I literally have like zero nutrients in my tank now. Like it's like zero to two nitrates and like zero phosphates. And I just keep dumping them food. So some, something's magical or crazy with all the filtration, but it's the lowest I've ever had in my life. And, I, and I've just been feeding so much lately. It's crazy. And the corals are taken off too. So there's definitely some good benefits to doing it. Yeah, I think that's the thing, though, Deb, that's like with a low-nutrient system, we've got to kind of remember that when we water test, what we're testing is evidence, so mm-hmm. what's left in the water. But if you're running a very efficient system in the fact that you know you're feeding well mm-hmm. and your corals are growing well, it's not that you're running an ultra-low-nutrient system, it's just that your corals are keeping up with the production, right? Yeah. Um, and your filtration at the same time. But um, it's difficult, I think... <sighs> In the sort of like, I'd say like, if you think of it in terms of beginner, um, competent, um, advanced, expert, and then mm-hmm. guru, <laughs> in, if you look at it that kind of like in that fashion, I'd say for a beginner and a competent sort of level of reefing, mm-hmm. it's it can be difficult to tell uh, when you've got a really efficient system in terms of your coral, you know, utilize it, mm-hmm. and if you're actually running low where your corals aren't benefiting and you could get like you say you can get that crash because it's it's too low yeah in the production so i would say with knowing your tank and the amount of corals and stuff you've got i would just say that it, it's like when you do a water test and you've got loads of hair algae in your tank and you're saying well i haven't got any nitrates and phosphates because mm-hmm. i haven't got any on my test reading but you've got all this algae growing and it's like well yeah because that's consuming if you didn't have the algae then you'd see it in your in your water test, right? Yep, exactly. Another another thing to consider too. Sometimes when people have algae in their tank and they're still reading really low, it's because that algae is absorbing as as it's growing inside your tank. So, mm. but so I think in your case, it's probably your corals are absorbing, yep. <laughs> right? Your corals are eating it. So I mean, it's not necessarily because it's low. It's just that you, your corals are doing well, really well. And they're keeping up with mm-hmm. the production. And my chato grows like no tomorrow. So between the two, it's. <laughs> doing his job. Um, now, I guess the other question is: Do you think? I mean, as long as you don't have nutrient issues, do you think you can overfeed your fish? So, I mean, one of the downsides of overfeeding is obviously nutrients and algae and other stuff. 
um, mm. on the fish side, like if you could your fish overeat itself, like is there fish obesity? Do you think something like that would be an issue or a concern? Yeah, definitely. Because if you if you look, I mean, the fish are like any other animal. Like, um, I, I sometimes like, I don't know, because I don't like to be critical of people. Because I know, like, it's not fair, right? Mm. And 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 we're not here to laugh at people or make fun of people. But so every now and again, I'll I'll see a, somebody post up something like. Uh, this is really excellent food because when I put it in my tank, all my fish eat it instantly and they absolutely love it. Mm -hmm. And then I always think, well, if you've got a three-year-old or four-year-old toddler uh, and you just gave them chocolate uh, three times a day, every day, they would probably consume that and love it. But it doesn't necessarily mean that's the diet you should mm -hmm. be giving them. Yeah, you know, uh, And that's the thing. And do, do some companies put stuff in the food to make it taste good so entice your fish to eat it yep and that's why they eat it or are yep. they are they doing that as well as putting all the the you know vitamins and beneficial things that the fish needs as well as mm -hmm. yeah, who who knows you know the, and this is the thing what what's in the food that makes it attractive to fish is it because it's good wholesome food or is it because there's you know the fish equivalent of chocolate and sugar in it. <laughs> yeah, you know? exactly. Right. <laughs> so, moral moral of the story is feed good stuff to your tank and your fish. Don't cheap out on the two or three dollars and buy a an empty food that is, you know, just going to cause issues down the road. Another thing to consider too is I know people don't always think of this up front, but when if you buy a fish, fish can live 15, 20 years, right? Like that's a long term pet, so you got to feed them good stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's the other thing for me is um, sometimes you see people and they uh, say a fish has died and there's no obvious evidence of disease in the tank and could be had fish a few years. So, you know, it, it, I've had it a few years, so maybe it's just old. But then I see other people with like pff, uh, 10, 15 year old Chromis, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, you know, who knows? It might. And people say, oh, maybe it had a brain tumor or maybe it had a heart failure or something wrong with its heart or something and it just packed up eventually and then i sometimes wonder i wonder whether it was diet related but yeah look fat fat and people always say fat and healthy and sometimes i think maybe it was fat and unhealthy i know i know i always laugh you know? about that one too so does it yeah, work with people um, fat and healthy it doesn't work that way sadly <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like I said, I did a little bit of research and looked into some stuff, and and some of the the stuff I, I found, the research I found, they did talk about fatty liver disease and you mm -hmm. know fatty hearts and stuff. If if you don't get a balanced diet, that could again, be from just feeding all protein and not really feeding enough. Yeah, veggies. exactly, and and that it, yeah, it made sense to me because then I'm thinking, yeah, if we if we just you know feed one type of thing is that what happens the fish lives for mm -hmm. two three years but as it's living it's also dying you know if that makes sense mm -hmm. um dr welsh was asking do you recommend fe rinsing frozen food if you're having an issue with phosphates then in theory it's a good idea personally i've never rinsed it in my life like not even once so i've never done it uh, i know lots of people that do rinse it and they say it makes a big difference on phosphates mileage may vary yeah i would say it depends on the uh, it's you know on the frozen food i know for me the rinse in the frozen food if there's a lot of water that comes with the food i'd be questioning how much money you're spending on water mm -hmm. rather than food so i wouldn't be very happy you know dissolving a cube to find 60 percent of it was water that i then rinsing down the sink so that it didn't give me phosphate and then the other thing is like, if if the water contains phosphate because they generally use that as a preservative, right? Yeah. Then if it's from the preservative, isn't that then being absorbed into the food itself to preserve it? Mm -hmm. So yeah, it will cut it down, which I understand. But then I'm like, well, just go to the supermarket and buy some prawns, mussels, white fish, and make your own. Yeah. Because it's it, it's cheaper. Mm-hmm. And there's no preservative in it, so you don't have to worry about the phosphate. No, nope, exactly. So, yeah, if you're having an issue with nutrients, rinse. If you're not, throw it in. To me, I don't want to lose any of those little micro particles and those little bits, because to me, that's just is free coral food. So 
that's why I yeah. don't rinse it personally. It's because I'm like, oh, look at all those little bits, all my little pulps. <laughs> You and your, cool. your your tank isn't suffering from phosphate levels either by doing that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe uh, you can get away with not rinsing it if your either your coral mm -hmm. stock or your filtration is, can deal with it. If that yep. makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So speaking of the manufacturers, I'm actually that was kind of a good tie-in because I don't know when, but sometime in the next month or so, I'm gonna go do one with PE because I've been feeding that food ever since I got in the hobby. And then like a year ago, I learned they're actually local ish to me. So I'm like, Oh wow. Yeah. They're like a 45 minute an hour drive. So one day I'm going to go visit their office. I've kind of half talked to them about it. So one of these days I'm going to go down there. Yeah. That the, sounds really cool. the cool thing I found, like after using it for like four years, that's harvested from my local lake that I can like see on my window. I was like, Hey, my fish food comes from there. So that's kind of cool. <laughs> kind of fun. Um, I do think I'm going to have to cut her off now for today because the wife works in 15 minutes and needs to steal the office. So, <laughs> but thanks for coming on, Nick. Thanks for everyone hanging out today. Hey, always a pleasure, Dad. Always a pleasure. As always, guys, if you enjoyed it, smash that thumbs up button. If you're new, make sure you guys subscribe, hit the bell. And yeah, we'll be back Monday for another video and next Wednesday for another live stream. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Nick. <laughs>